One, two, three. Ugh. All right. It's only taken me about a month to write this. <laughs> Greetings and welcome to the channel. If you're coming back, hey, thanks. You're special. So I've seen and heard a lot of talk lately of the death of movie theaters and people blaming the usual suspects. Was it streaming? The pandemic? Superhero fatigue? Or Bob Iger stripping Disney for parts? Others have said it's for the better and that they're not dying, they're evolving into so-called high-end experiences. Because who doesn't love being interrupted by an Alamo Drafthouse employee scurrying between the rows asking what $12 beer you'd like while Christopher Nolan obliterates your eardrums with the sound of an A-bomb in Dolby Atmos. <laughs> movies that should have done well are bombing and movies that no one asked for are making billions of dollars. While all of this might be true about the declining interest in the movie theater experience, to me, there's another larger and older problem within the film industry the birth of the movie star. Our obsession with movie stars and celebrity culture in general, the cost of their exorbitant salaries, and the cycle of oversaturation of the same couple dozen faces also contributes to bad, stupid, and sometimes needless movies. When audiences are underwhelmed, they're unwilling to physically go to a theater, and when they do, they act like complete slobs. It doesn't help knowing that most new releases will be available to rent in a couple of weeks after they premiere, not the several months that it used to be. I think this can all be traced back to movie stars themselves, unwittingly, and in some cases knowingly, dictating the kinds of stories studios decide to make, market, and release. They also have to be extremely safe, favoring familiarity over originality, where studios would rather reanimate the corpse of Harold Ramis or yank Linda Hamilton out of her retirement home rather than write something new that might cost a little less than $300 million. The mere existence of the movie star has set a precedent within Hollywood that is no longer such a sure thing and has studios churning out calculated content that's repetitive and lazy. We only occasionally end up with an event movie like Avengers Endgame now. Seriously, look at the list of 2023 blockbusters. Besides Barbenheimer, did any of these really feel like an event you had to experience in the theater? You could make the argument for Dune, and Barbenheimer was only a thing because the internet made a meme out of it. Not some marketing guru in an office somewhere. <laughs> Every generation has their own definition of a movie star, a term which itself is constantly changing. To give a very abbreviated history of the movie star, screen actors are being commodified as larger-than-life personas and exploited through the predatory star system as early as the 1920s. Young actors were given completely new personas, including entirely fictional backgrounds and names, where they would essentially sign over their inalienable rights to studios in perpetuity. Focusing more on their image rather than their talent or ability, many performers lived under actor house arrest, particularly female actors who were never to be seen in public without makeup or extravagant clothing. Both men and women signed morality clauses that dictated their behavior in the public where studios would arrange sham relationships between them, going so far as to spread rumors they had died in order to generate publicity. Movie stars played dual roles, one on screen and one in real life, basically performing 24-7, which is probably why so many of them were doped up on meth. By the 1960s, the star system was replaced with more contemporary agencies managing talent as opposed to studios owning actors like indentured servants and were licensed under the California Labor Code. Some of their autonomy was returned to them, but even today, movie stars have to be on when doing press and aware of their behavior in public to avoid endless memification like Ben Affleck whose publicist probably has a decent collection of wigs with the amount of hair pulling they've done every time he steps out to pick up his Duncan order, or has a fight with Jennifer Lopez. The star system failed due to its own gatekeeping and its many controversies, as well as the changing landscape of film. Audiences began wanting more than garish musicals and slapstick comedies, demanding instead gritty social commentaries about the human condition and race and class. The 1960s was defined by the New Hollywood Movement, with independent productions giving a voice to emerging creators as the art form became more democratized, thanks in part to technological advancements that lowered the barrier to entry. Directors and writers and actors weren't as beholden to big studios and began making some of the most iconic films of the last 60 years. 
and also some absolute trash. With the art form being more accessible, it was easier than ever for anyone to try their hand at filmmaking that might launch them into superstardom. The more people able to participate in art, the better. I've always said that. But it also means people of questionable talent and intent create some of the lowest common denominator schlock. You can thank Golem and Globus for pumping out junk films for several decades, some so bad they're good. In 1975, Jaws opened and redefined the industry yet again. It's considered the first blockbuster and for the rest of the decade and into the early 90s, Hollywood had reclaimed its golden era of prestige, rebounding with some of the best movies ever made in my opinion. The movie star was also reborn, better than ever and bigger than ever, both physically and financially, where they would command multi-million dollar salaries and had big beefy muscles. <laughs> That's not to say the B-movie industrial complex went away, it's still thriving and possibly worse than ever, tricking gullible, illiterate audiences with cheap mockbusters. I'm obviously not talking about cult classic B-movies like The Room or anything Neil Breen has ever done. I wouldn't be surprised if those movies are studied in film school for how bizarre and unhinged they are. Over the decades, the artist was being replaced with the movie star, falling into a similar trap as 1920s star system actors. Though not under such controlling contracts, actors turned movie star were just as scrutinized and idolized, if not more so. Tabloids and magazines of varying integrity gossiped about their inner lives and the public ate it up. Movie stars now had their own teams of publicists and managers and assistants dedicated to crafting their individual personas. The shift away from studios owning the rights of individual actors to movie stars being managed by agencies meant they could be packaged together for the studios. Agencies sold actors in groups to better control budgets, schedules, and even casting. It's still how a lot of productions work today and is a way to cast a wider net to get more people to see your movie. A good example of this was packaging Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Harold Ramis together for Ghostbusters in order to sell the movie to their individual fans, despite Murray's reluctance to sign on, and when he finally did, he was a pain in the ass the entire production. If you've ever been curious or suspicious of how Adam Sandler is able to pump out movie after movie with all of his washed up friends, it's because of packaging. With all those names attached, there's bound to be someone who wants to see one of these Netflix-funded vacations disguised as a cynical, unfunny movie. Allegedly. The more control agencies had over negotiating productions, the bigger the salaries and budgets got, but so did the risk. Studios had to rely on actor bankability by employing the most popular fan favorites to ensure their money pit of a movie didn't put them out of business. The problem is, in order for your summer blockbuster to be successful, it has to be a four-quadrant movie and appeal to as many people as possible or a cheap horror movie that makes 4,000 times its budget. It's why children's animated movies are more for adults than actual children, and why there are more PG-13 movies now than ever before. More importantly, studios and producers in non-creative roles have consistently been unable to comprehend the tastes of their audience for basically ever. Audiences now are tired of poorly planned films with bad ideas, like how John Peters, hairdresser turned executive, thought Superman should fight a giant spider for some reason. He did eventually get his giant steampunk spider in the wild wild west, so good for him, I guess. <laughs> As business people often do, they misjudge what people want and there is no movie star they can throw at a project that will fix it anymore. Audiences aren't that stupid and can tell when movies are rushed or have too many writers or not enough. Audiences suffer because we end up with a Frankenstein movie that is an illogical mess with pacing issues, terrible CGI, and lackluster performances by otherwise incredible actors because they don't know what the hell is happening in any given scene. I'll cue you for the, I, say, three, two, one, crash. Just, just tell me what happens and then, and then I'll try and do it without you. Okay. Telling me. This is all cyclical and you can see similarities between what's happening today and what was going on in the 1960s. Massive movies like Cleopatra, for example, were flopping while smaller movies with a 20th of the budget, like The Graduate, were making almost twice the box office. Not to mention other weird, borderline experimental and foreign films getting critical acclaim. Today, for every quantum mania that bombs and is forgotten about or clowned on, there's a Poor Things or an Anatomy of a Fall that win awards and receive critical praise. Overpaid movie stars weren't guaranteeing the success of a movie in the 60s, and they aren't now. 
Interesting stories and good writing are and always have. The historical over-reliance on big stars sets a precedent that continues to affect the industry negatively today. Betting on star power often leads to repetitive and uninspired films where audiences are disenchanted and less likely to visit theaters, preferring a fresh story over a familiar face. I just saw the trailer for the third Venom and Chi Wotel Ejiofor is the villain, I think. But wait, didn't he play a different character in a different Marvel movie? And didn't Haley Steinfeld and Gemma Chan and Josh Brolin and Michelle Yeoh also play multiple characters in the same cinematic universe? I'm so confused. And no, I don't care that some of these characters appear in the Sony universe and others in the MCU, which are totally different and disconnected, except when they're not. Was there really no one else they could have cast? Was it part of an agency packaging deal? Is Sony stupid? I swear, they probably cast the same actors because they played a different character as a way to trick moviegoers. Movie stars are also partially to blame because they keep taking these roles. The studios have seemingly learned nothing about oversaturating the market with what feels like the same 50 actors starring in every major studio film. And when they're not casting the same actor in the same universe as a different character, the actors are basically playing the same person in every movie. Look at The Rock's filmography he plays the same indistinguishable buff guy who has to save the world or his family in like 80% of the movies he's in, and it's boring. I'm not expecting him to have the range of Daniel Day-Lewis and do Hamlet or anything, but Jesus Christ, he seems to be going out of his way to be typecast. To be fair to movie stars, a lot of this is due to studio and agency pressure where the postmodern movie star indirectly prevents the industry from evolving. Their management teams are in a constant full court press exploiting parasocial relationships by insinuating, this is what you want, trust us and eat your slob, until they're a dried up husk with nothing left to give. Just look at the countless direct-to-video geezer teasers employing once great movie stars like Adrian Brody, what the hell happened? Even just 20 years ago, movie stars had a longer lifespan because there was still some mystery. That unprecedented access creates some weird online interactions that border on attachment disorders. Have you ever gone to the comment section of Scarlett Johansson or Zendaya's Instagram? It's weird. What are these people even saying? I'm sure most of them are also probably bots, which is a whole other problem, but movie stars are also somewhat to blame for occasionally encouraging the behavior by merely implementing it in their PR strategy. Take Vin Diesel's online presence. He has one of the weirdest digital footprints of cringy, valueless content. It always fascinates me um, how beautiful America is. We're at a high elevation lake here and you can see snow in the mountains in the back. Very cool, Vin. <laughs> we don't need to know this much about these people, and it can actually do more harm to their image than good. If you turn over every stone yourself for the public to gawk at, what is there left to be surprised by? This all feels like an attempt to convince audiences that they're just like normal people, as if their fame hasn't changed them, when in reality, they couldn't be more out of touch. Except for a few. I know there's some actors that like retire onto like a, a ranch, and raise goats and stuff, they seem okay. <laughs> like when they guilt trip their fans who make $38,000 a year or less to donate to some charity from one of their eight multi-million dollar homes. And if they're not doing it of their own volition, their team of publicists and managers are parading them around on every <laughs> chicken eating interview show during press junkets to the point the audiences are seeing the likes of Glenn Powell's rodent face. His management needs to be careful because I feel like he is this close to overexposure. Glenn Powell seems okay. I'm not tired of him yet, but some people are. I And I get it. You know, the economic and sociopolitical circumstances of audiences also brings up the issue of class. I don't know about you, but when I see how many millions of dollars movie stars earn playing make-believe, I feel a not insignificant amount of resentment. Or when they tell unrelatable stories on late night, or when Mark Wahlberg creates 539 times the CO2 emissions in a single year than the average person. Why should I give a shit about whatever reboot they're starring in when they're poisoning the planet? Audiences love to hate movie stars, sometimes with good reason, sometimes not so much, but you can't blame audiences for having a sense of ire towards overpaid twats, taking 15 minute private jet flights just so they can save 30 minutes of drive time. You can make the argument that their exorbitant salaries serve as a kind of insurance that helps insulate them from the public and fans who maybe want to assassinate them. 
or stalk them, or do other weird, psychotic things. I get that. All things being relative, they are in a position of vulnerability, making it extremely hard to live a normal life. However, their naivete or ignorance to fan perception doesn't negate valid feelings of a system rigged against the majority of the participants, especially when most of them are only movie stars because of nepotism, or luck, or both. Countless other movie stars have held the limelight for several decades despite ill repute, like Tom Cruise being a weirdo Scientologist, or Brad Pitt physically assaulting Angelina Jolie, or Roman Polanski raping girl who can rehabilitate their image by simply hiring a stylist or run away to another country. In the case of the ones that do fade, it's usually caused by a variety of compounding incidents, like Will Smith, who just won't go away. He was already in decline and slowly losing touch by overexposing himself long before the slap for being a cringy, attention-seeking narcissist. He forced his son to be Will 2.0 and star in After Earth, was cucked by his wife for almost a decade, and then thought it'd be a good idea to try his hand at being a YouTuber for some reason. What are you doing? The Rock is on a similar trajectory who many considered to be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger, who always seemed pretty gracious and grateful in interviews, but then the cracks started to show. We started to see how vain and fake he was in his banter with Kevin Hart, quite frankly, became obnoxious and grating. Over the years, more stories of how he's a diva on set started circulating, which has left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. His recent return to wrestling also doesn't indicate to me that his movie career is doing gangbusters. I wonder why. He's now apparently taking a page from the Dave Batista playbook by doing a serious role in an A24 film by Benny Safdie. Or maybe it's the Mickey Rourke playbook. He's just recreating the wrestler. The public has always had a hard time disentangling the art from the artist, but also the artist from the real person and the real person from the entrepreneur. In order to be a movie star today, it's almost a requisite that they own a media company or a skincare line or just so many alcohol brands. Every time I see Ryan Reynolds, all I think of is an ad for Aviation Gin or Mint Mobile. Not only does it feel like he's in every movie, he's in every YouTube and Hulu ad, which creates a strange feeling when I do see him in a movie meant to be entertaining escapism or even art. It just feels like I'm being sold Ryan Reynolds the brand and not Ryan Reynolds the artist. After all, actors are supposed to inhabit the character they're playing, becoming someone else entirely to tell a story that's maybe meaningful or provocative. But how am I supposed to suspend my disbelief or become wrapped in a story when I associate them more with a vodka brand I've never heard of? I refuse to believe these things are real. It's even harder to separate the artist from the entrepreneur when the artist is a domestic abuser or a racist or an alleged cannibal trying to sell us their personal brand. I honestly can't get over the irony of Army Hammer owning a bakery, dude. What is this, Sweeney Todd? Is he making meat pies out of his victims? It's crazy! Because movie stars are so recognizable, studios still see them as a safe bet, when in actuality, it's just a reminder that they've got something to shill. It's exhausting going to a movie theater that was once an oasis of relaxation and escapism, only to see a trailer for a movie starring the lady from the Uber Eats commercials. None of this is good for audiences or the art form, but neither is it good for emerging talent, because audiences are so starved for variety, when new faces do get a shot, the internet instantaneously creates obsessive fans who go right back to picking them apart because they want to see someone other than Chris fucking Pratt. And can you blame them? Speaking of Chris Pratt, I guess he's voicing every animated movie now. <laughs> Up until the late 90s, animation was voiced by professional voice actors, which is a different talent altogether than being a screen actor. Because animated movies cost so much money and take so long to produce, they need a name that will get butts in seats. Children don't really care who voices Mario, but their parents might, especially millennial parents who have some nostalgia for <laughs> Parks and Rec or whatever IP is being adapted. It used to be that animated movies had a few references for the parents, but now these movies are almost solely made for people in their 30s and 40s, which isn't inherently a bad thing. Things like Spider-Verse and any Miyazaki movie are artful cinema, but there's been a trend for the better part of 30 years where animation studios have relied more and more on stunt casting and hiring not just movie stars, but any relatively famous celebrity to voice everything from leading roles to cameos. You end up with a movie where the performer is more important than the character they're meant to voice. Well-known characters end up sounding indistinguishable from Chris Pratt's normal speaking voice, 
or have Aquafina, who voices all of these characters. She's just stealing jobs at this point. Voice acting is a completely different specialized skill, and in my opinion, neither of these people have the vocal range required to create compelling, unique characters through their vocal cords alone. Screen acting at least lets you use all your body parts and is usually enhanced by costumes and makeup and co-stars and sets and everything else. The most notable and maybe first instance of stunt casting in an animated movie was Robin Williams as the genie in Aladdin. The character of the genie was even directly inspired by Williams where the animators created test footage using one of his stand-up routines. It's also very important to note that Williams did not want his performance to be used in the marketing of the movie, which the studio ignored completely because what? Were they really not gonna promote the fact they got Robin Williams, one of the biggest names in comedy or even Hollywood at the time? Was he crazy? From then on, the precedent was set for future animation studios to cast movie stars in every animated leading role while voice actors were left with characters like Roadkill slash Busboy or to just sing their musical numbers on their behalf instead of actors because they can't sing either. <laughs> My name is Jean Valjean. And I'm Javier. I could go on and on about movie stars wearing out their welcome and imposing their influence on studio decision making that results in underwhelming derivative movies. Movie stars are only afforded the amount of leverage they have due to a combination of things and the perceived death of theaters has many causes as well. Some real others imagined. Movie theaters aren't going anywhere and they are evolving, even if that evolution is just doing monopolistic vertical integration of the 1920s. It'll take a while for exhibitors to judge the terrain and make movie going an experience worthy of leaving your house for. It'd be great if people would stop fighting each other during the trailers as well. Just like the pandemic affected theater attendance by normalizing waiting for a movie to come to streaming, so has the constant bombardment of the movie star enervated audiences where they don't even want to rent whatever movie is being shoved down their throats. Maybe theaters will become more like Broadway where it's extremely expensive and exclusive. Maybe we'll all tire of watching new releases from our beds. One thing is for certain, we're not suffering from superhero or comic book fatigue, we're suffering from movie star fatigue and bad writing fatigue that's exacerbated by the very existence of the movie star. Also sequel and reboot fatigue. I went through IMDb's list of upcoming releases the other day and my god. Deadpool and Wolverine, Alien Romulus, The Crow, Beetlejuice, Transformers, Joker but make it a French musical I think. Terrifier 3, Smile 2, Venom 3, Gladiator 2, Moana 2, Lord of the Rings, War of the Rohirrim, Mufasa, A Lion King prequel, Nosferatu, Wolfman, Snow White, 28 years later, Jurassic World 4, and I shit you not, The Passion of the Christ, look who's back! <laughs> it's actually the resurrection, but seriously. They should give it like a fun 1980 sequel title like uh, Look Who's Talking, Look Who's Talking 2. Is that the title? Is that the, what the sequel? Some of these I am interested in, and they do look good, and they're not all sequels and reboots. There are a lot of movies that seem like they're original IPs, like Blink Twice, which looks like a fun murder mystery comedy in the vein of Bodies, 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 or Glass Onion. I also want to say I like movies, and many of the movie stars I've mentioned. A lot of the problems associated with movie stardom and its effects on cinema and the perceived death of theaters comes from the fact that actors end up being the face of these productions. We put way too much stock into the idea of them and they ultimately receive way too much flack for when a movie doesn't live up to the impossibly high expectations. How many examples do we need that fame drives even the most mentally fortified individual from going apeshit in an Air One parking lot? We demand too much of them and in turn them of us. It's a mutual contribution to the continued commodification and nascency of assembly line movies. With everyone being a critic now, studios have access to all kinds of opinions and datas that they can use, but most of the loudest critics and so-called fans lack any amount of media literacy, so studios end up with mixed messages. It's like how Google's AI started telling people you should eat at least one small rock a day because it scraped the information from a shit post on Reddit. Not the most reliable source. <laughs> I'd say small mid-budget movies need to make a comeback, but for that to happen, studios need to rethink actor salaries altogether. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. got paid $40 million for his role in Civil War, which was the entire budget of Knives Out that had almost two dozen veteran up-and-coming and current in-demand movie stars, including Downey's own Civil War co-star Chris Evans. They made a whole movie. 
I think studios have learned that not every movie is gonna make a billion dollars or needs a budget equivalent to the GDP of the Marshall Islands. It seems like they've started investing in these sorts of movies recently, like Maxine, The Bike Riders, Monkey Man, and Anyone But You. Obviously, there's a lot of nuance to the topic of the death of movie theaters and the machine that is the film industry. I just wanted to voice how I see the overexposure of movie stars affecting what gets made and why theater going feels like a nightmare I don't want to participate in anymore. I can't be the only person feeling a sense of aversion and annoyance every time I see a movie star. They don't even have to have done something bad for me to feel disgust. I honestly don't even know if movie theaters are actually that bad or if I've just become tired of keeping up with who's in what and why I should care about something like The Fall Guy or another five Planet of the Apes movies? Really? Ah, oh, fuck. That's the video. Thanks so much for sticking around. And if you made it this far, that means you're special, which I already said at the beginning of this video, but you're extra special if you made it this far. You need a like, you need a comment, you need to share, and you need to subscribe. You watch the whole video. You have to do those things. Sorry, those are the rules. Those are the rules on this channel. Thank you so much for sticking around and supporting the channel. I know it was a long period between releases. Um, that's my fault. Uh, everything I was writing down, um, I hated. And then I felt like I went through a little, just a little depressive episode uh, where I was completely unmotivated and didn't even want to open up YouTube or, you know, I just, did, I wanted to play video games. That was it. So, um, but I'm back, everything's fine. Um, but then I was gone for a wedding and so I didn't, I just haven't had any time. I just haven't had any time. If you subscribe, you should sign up for notifications because I'm in the community section all the time giving updates about the channel. And also you can go follow me on Instagram where I post updates there as well and memes and stuff that's going on in my life. This is the longest outro I think I've ever done. So I'm gonna go now, um, vanish. <laughs>